again, I want to just uh, take a moment to introduce our special guest this morning, William Fetter. I'm thankful the uh, Concerned Women for America the local chapter were, were uh, behind bringing Bill to the St. Louis area. Uh, but St. Louis, uh, St. Louis is Bill's home. He's from this area. He lives in Florida right now. Who could blame him for that, right? Uh, but he lives in Florida. And I met Bill for the very first time uh, many, many years ago. I first, it, it took me about 25 years that Jill and I have had the blessing to be a part of this church family here. And about that time when we came here, I met you because they were staging a Brentwood parade. Y'all know the, the, the wonderful July 4th parades we have, right? And they're staging the parade right here at our parking lot for the church. And that's when I first met uh, Bill Fetter. He gave me his card, and I got to know a little bit about him. He's running for office. And um, I looked up and began to immediately begin to read all the things that he writes. He is a prolific writer. He is a very well-known author. Uh, you probably have seen him on TV, any number of TV shows, news shows. Uh, he has been interviewed on the radio many, many different times. Uh, you know that I love history. You know that I love America. You know that I often speak about uh, America. Well, I just have to say a lot of that wisdom didn't come straight from me. It came from Bill to me, to you, okay? And so I've been so blessed as a, as a pastor, but as an American, by your ministry, your writing, and you're just relentless, just doing everything you can to help people to know the true story, the real history. So put your hands together and let's welcome Bill Fetter to our church today. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, one of the things that my wife and I put together, it's a book called Miracles in American History. And it's when things look really bad and we have leaders that call us to pray and have courage and things turn around. So Revolution, War of 1812, Civil War, Barbary Pirate War, different times. And because um, I write a lot of history, she says, get to the good stuff where, where things turn around. <laughs> and then uh, another book uh, called Socialism, The Real History from Plato to the Present. Basically, socialism is <clears throat> counterfeit Christianity and the differences between the word voluntary and involuntary. The early church voluntarily sold their property and laid the funny money at the feet of the apostles. They didn't have the Roman government take away their property and lay it at the feet of Pilate. Anyway, that's a whole nother message. So um, today I have one where I go through all the world history and I show the most common form of governments, kings. Nimrod, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. And as the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger. Because with military advancements, kings can kill more people. And with technological advancements, kings can track more people. Until finally the king of England was the biggest king on the planet. Sun never set on the British Empire. He was a globalist. He was a one world government guy. India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, Barbados, Bermuda. And America's founders did not like a globalist one world government guy telling us what to do. So they broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. And they got their ideas from where? Well, the colonial pastors, but they got it from the Bible. And what part of the Bible? I'll tell you about that. So uh, stick with me here. So let's jump into some history. And uh, so kings are the most common form of government. What the king believed, the kingdom had to believe. Pretty simple. Nebuchadnezzar blows the trumpets and says, bow to my statue. And, and so in Europe, uh, you had um, Henry VIII, Right, uh, burning uh, William Tyndall at the stake, right? And, uh, and so you had Anglicans killing uh, these Puritans, and then you had the King of Spain killing a bunch of, you know, uh, Dutch reform there in um, uh, Antwerp, and then the, the Queen of France uh, killing a bunch of Huguenots. It's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And, and so you had um, these religious wars, and so you had uh, Catholics killing Protestants, and Protestants killing Catholics, and Protestants killing Protestants, lots of killing going on. We don't want to get into all that, but we want to sort of trace where America came from. And so you had in uh, uh, Switzerland, a guy named John Calvin, and he's wrestling with what do you do with Romans 13? Let everyone be subject to the governing authority for there is no authority except that which is God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. It's like, okay, but what do you do if, if the government literally wants to kill you and your wife and kids? Are you supposed to say, okay, we're well, here we are, kill us. <laughs> and so um, 
John Calvin over in um, Switzerland says, well, when the kings disobey God, they automatically abdicate their worldly power. In other words, um, we are subject to the men who rule, rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they come in anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. Very similar to uh, children obey your parents is in the Bible. But what if there is a bad parent that tells the kid to kill the neighbor and sell themselves into prostitution? Is the kid supposed to obey the parent then? No, they, the child obeys the parent as long as the parent's telling them to do something that lines up with God's word. So you obey the government as long as the government's telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. It's very similar to Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail, 1963. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. One that has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. <laughs> Right? God's not going to command you to do something and then command you to submit to somebody that's going to make you not do what he just commanded you to do. And, um, and so these Calvinist Puritans in Scotland began to develop a concept of how to have a government without a king. And uh, they looked to the Bible as their example. But what part of the Bible? That first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. So when you read through all the world history, one nation stands out. Around 1400 BC, Israel comes out of Egypt. And for 400 years, they do not have a king. This is called the Hebrew Republic. And these Calvinist Puritans that studied this were called Christian Hebraists. That's why they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. And so King Saul is actually the dividing point between England and America. The kings of England looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the anointed King Saul and on period. These Calvinist Puritan founders of New England, they looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the pre-King Saul period. This 400 years where you had millions of Israelites and no king. And it worked because every citizen was taught the law and every citizen was personally accountable to God to follow the law. And uh, so let's look, you have this 1400 BC, Israel comes out of Egypt for 400 years, no king. And um, so if you look at all government is somewhere on this line. One side is total government, the other side is no government. Now total government, kings rule through fear. You do what they say or they kill you. Well, if there's no government, uh, it would be anarchy. Right? So yeah, everybody has liberty and freedom, but if everybody has it, it's gonna be like chaos. And so that's where they had a couple things they had to add in. Number one, everybody was taught the law. I was trying to think of a way of explaining it. Imagine if everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. We all have GPS, tells you where to turn. Imagine if you could download an app that would tell you how to act in real time. So it's monitoring your blood pressure and your voice volume and sees there's somebody in close vicinity and it runs this little algorithm. You're, you're about to lose your temper. <laughs> alert, alert, don't lose your temper, you know. And then it's monitoring your bank account, sees it's a little low, and then geo position, it sees you're in the store with expensive stuff. And it runs this little algorithm, you're being tempted to steal. Bzz, bzz, don't steal, don't steal, right? And um, and so everyone in Israel downloads this law. And, and the Levite priests are the computer geeks that help you to download it. Now, where do you go to get that app? Okay, Apple Store, Google Play, Line Upon Line Priesthood, press this button here, bus, right? And uh, so everybody in Israel downloaded this behavioral app, the law. But the big question is, why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Israel had the key ingredient. There is a God who is watching everyone. He wants it to be fair, 
and he's gonna hold you accountable in the future. You're about to steal, nobody's around, you know you can get away with it. And then you think, God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's gonna hold me accountable in the future. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. And it creates something in your head called the conscience. If everybody in the country believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. Maximum liberty. Women can go anywhere without fear. You don't have to lock your doors, right? Because everybody's taught the law. Everybody believes God's watching them, watching them to be fear, going to hold them accountable in the future. Now, God knew the Israelites would sin. And rather than them walk around the rest of their life anticipating being judged, once a year they had the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and they sacrificed the lamb and uh, the young and the lamb could also mean a young goat or a young uh, sheep in the hebrew term and so they um this with a scapegoat uh, one of them they kill it they bring the blood into the holy holy sprinkle it on the mercy seat right so you got this box called the ark of the covenant inside of the box are the ten commandments and then there's a lid with two angels on top and the presence of the lord is between the angels and um so here you got the Lord on top of the Ten Commandments and the high priest walks in and um, he sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat. So the blood is sprinkled between the presence of the Lord and the Ten Commandments below. It's like in between. And the blood actually changed it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. If the high priest would have come representing the people and he didn't have blood, you'd have the Lord looking at the Ten Commandments, looking at the people that broke it, it'd be judgment time. But he sprinkles the blood saying, uh, the lamb took the judgment that we deserved upon itself. And then the priest comes out of the temple and then to demonstrate what just happened, he lays his hand on this other goat, and it's called the scapegoat, and uh, confesses the sins of the nation over it. And it's taken away and let go. And so that's symbolic of, we just got all of our sins taken away and we let go, we're let go free. And, um, Anyway, so we take the power of the king, give it to the people, and all the people are taught the law, but they could still do what they wanted, and so they added something else to it called a covenant. And so this is where you're not just all individuals, we're individuals in covenant with each other and with the Lord. And uh, so you get blessings from God, and you voluntarily share those blessings with your neighbor in need because you're doing it as unto God, right? So, so we're a community of individuals. We individually get rights from God and we're individually fair to our neighbor because we're doing it as unto God. It's a way to have a government with no king. It's called a covenant form of government. And uh, the, you know what the Latin word for covenant is? Fidelis or federal. Federal government, it's a covenant. We have a covenant form of government. It goes all the way back to this period. Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my uh, church. That word church in Greek is ekklesia. Ek means out of, klesia means a calling. And there were 6,000 citizens in Athens. They called them out of their homes and they would all meet and they would decide who's gonna fix the walls and who's gonna teach the kids and they would give the up responsibilities. He's talking about his body, the body of Christ. Everybody has a part. Right? The, the pastor's job is to get everybody to have their own relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ that died on the cross to pay for their sins. And then the pastor coaches you to become a mature Christian. Read the Bible every day. Uh, pray every day. And then plug into the body and do something. Right? Nursery, children's church, junior high, outreach. Because anything that's alive takes in and gives out. For any muscle to grow, it has to be exercised. For you to grow in your Christian faith, you can't just hear a sermon. You have to put yourself in a position where there's somebody that, that has a need, right? Little kids, and then the Holy Spirit will teach them through you. And we've all been there. Well, maybe there's a person in need and you, you start sharing some scriptures and encourage, and you find yourself saying some really wise things. And you think to yourself, man, I didn't know I was that smart. Uh, you're not, it's the Holy Spirit that's giving you the words to speak, right? And I mean, it's like, I need to write that down. That was good, where did that come from? Or, or maybe there's a person with a financial need and you give to them and you see this 
joy and thankfulness on their face, face and they experience the love of God through a real person. And you experience the joy of the Lord of God using you to help somebody, right? So this is the body functioning, the eye and ear of foot. And um, anyway, and so um, the King of England didn't like that model. He liked the uh, hier hierarchical model because he was at the top. And so he, um, you see during this time uh, a development. Now we're tracing where America came from. And it basically, basically was a church plant. <laughs> and so uh, you had the king as the head of the Anglican church with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of York, and the deaneries and vicars and curates and rectors. And, and um, it's all hierarchical. Well, the, these um, uh, people that were called congregationalists uh, began to emphasize the, the congregation and, um, uh, it, and they would make a covenant with each other. In Scotland, they even called them covenanters. You ever get together in a small Bible study and you pray for each other and you care for each other? Well, they took it like the next step and it was like, we're gonna covenant with each other. Like for the rest of our lives, we're gonna be like friends and we're gonna care for each other and care for our kids. And, and, and this um, uh, basically was the church concept that they took with them when they founded the colonies in America. And that covenanting together turned into our form of government. So I'm gonna go through a couple. So one of the groups are called the Baptists. And this is when they got started in England. And uh, why is this significant? Because there was a uh, three founders of the Baptist faith in England, John Smith, Thomas Hellwise, and John Merton. Now this is a different John Smith than the uh, Virginia Pocahontas one, right? And, um, and so you'll see here, it says, uh, in the first Baptist church in England with fresh light on the Pilgrim's Father Church, because the Pilgrims branched off of John Smith's church. And um, now if you didn't believe the way your king did, you're persecuted and you're put in the Newgate prison. And uh, they didn't feed you in the English prison. You had to have some friend that missed you and would bring you food. And so uh, John Merton had a friend who brought him a bottle of milk. And when the guard wasn't around, uh, instead of a cork, it had a wad of paper. And when the guard wasn't around, he unfolded the paper, took a splinter, dipped it in the milk, and he wrote out his pamphlets. The milk dries, it's clear. And he um, puts it in the empty bottle and the guard takes it, his friend takes it home and unfolds it and holds the paper above a candle. And the heat of the candle turns the milk brown. And they could see what he wrote and they typeset it, they would print these pamphlets and the government's like, how's he getting it out of the prison cell? <laughs> and so the, the early Baptists called it the milk of the word because he wrote his pamphlets of milk. And one of the pamphlets he wrote was, no man ought to be persecuted for his religion. Another thing, uh, founder at this time was Thomas Hellwise, and he dies in the Newgate prison. And he said, the king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he hath no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them, to set spiritual lords over them. For men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. Neither may the king be judged between God and men. In other words, if the government can stand there on the day of judgment next to you and answer for your conscience while you believe something, fine, believe whatever the government tells you, whatever the next mandate is, fine, okay, I just gotta believe whatever the government tells me. But if the government's not gonna have a representative stand there next to you on the day of judgment, you are accountable to God for your own conscience, right? It's you and God, there's no, there's no government person there. And so you're accountable to God for your own conscience. Kings didn't like that. They wanted you to believe what they told you to believe. So King James says, I will make them conform themselves or else I will harry them out of the land. And so that's what happened. The um, one group of pilgrims sold their property, went down to the port, got on a boat, and they're about to take off when the captain robs them, turns them over to the police, and they're put in jail because they weren't believing the way the king did. Another group of these pilgrims arranged for a Dutch ship to come up the coast of England 
and they sold their property and they were going to meet and get in rowboats and row out and get on the British or the Dutch ship. Well, the pilgrims show up a day early and the ocean's really wavy and the boat's rocking, the kids are getting sick and the, the women say, can we just wait on the shore with the kids and, and uh, the men, uh, the, so the, finally the Dutch ship come, the men row out and they're storing everything on the ship. But before they can come back and get the women and children, somebody saw this Dutch ship come up and told the police and the police come over the hill and capture the women and children. And the Dutch captain says, I don't have any army with me. Uh, he pulls anchor and sails away with the men. You can just imagine these women and children standing on the shore, watching that ship getting smaller and smaller and disappearing over the horizon. For two years, they pass these women and children from one court in England to another. Finally, a judge said, you didn't do anything wrong, just go home. They go, duh, we sold our homes. And so just to get them out of their hair, they put them on a boat, sent them to Holland. They were reunited with their husbands. Happy ending to that chapter. 12 years in Holland, Spain threatens to attack, and that's when they decide to come to America. And they were going to go to Jamestown, which was founded uh, 14 years earlier, but they get caught in a storm and they land 500 miles away from Jamestown. They try sailing south, but off the coast of Cape Cod, it's really shallow. They call them shoals or sandbars. And in a storm, your boat will get stuck and the waves will smash it up. So 3,000 ships have sunk off the coast of Cape Cod. And so the pilgrims almost sink. And the captain says, too dangerous. Let's go back to Plymouth Rock and everybody get off the boat. And these pilgrims are like, uh, we have a question. Who's going to be in charge? There's no king appointed person in our little boat. We were going to go to Jamestown and submit to the king's government. Well, they do something unique. They give themselves the authority to start a government. It's called the Mayflower Compact. The word compact means covenant. And it says this, we, in the presence of God, covenant ourselves into a civil body politic. So here you have a little church group doing their little Bible study, covenanting together, and they're in a boat and they don't want to get off and have everybody a law unto themselves and have chaos. They say, okay, let's, let's do this thing where we covenant ourselves together into a civil body politic. So you have a church group forming itself into a political group. Now, why did they do that? to enact just and equal laws as shall be thought most meet or necessary unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Instead of top-down rule by kings and pharaohs and Caesars and Kaisers and sultans and czars, it's ruled by we, just our little group in this little boat, covenanting ourselves together, agreeing to make laws and submit to them. And uh, it's the difference between a dead pyramid ruled top down or a living tree where every root and every tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients to keep the thing alive. Right? Everybody's needed. Like everybody's involved in church. Everybody's doing something, nursery, children's church, junior, and everybody's doing something being involved. And so kings have subjects who are subjected to their will and democracies and republics have citizens. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-sovereign, co-ruler, co-king, right? And so it's not just we're, we're covenanting together, but in a sense, we're all sort of co-kings. And so you're a citizen of America. You are a co-king of America. We pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic. We're, we're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves without a king. And so when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I protest this system where I participate in ruling myself. It's like, okay, somebody else will tell you what to do. So where did the pilgrims, again, get this idea? From their pastor, John Robinson, whose little church had split away from the Baptist founder, John Smith's church. And that painting hangs in our U.S. Capitol, Rotunda. And so this covenant form of government you get blessings from God. You voluntarily share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. Um, Pil Pilgrim pastor John Robinson said, we are knit together as a body in covenant of the Lord, tied to care for each other's good. 
Puritan founder of Massachusetts, John Winthrop, this love among Christians is a real thing, not imaginary, necessary to the being of the body of Christ. We are fellow members of Christ, knit together by this bond of love. We must make one another's condition our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. And so the King of England turns up the heat, persecutes them some more, a lot of these Puritans come over, and you have this phenomenon where you have pastors and their churches founding cities. You have a pastor, John Lothrop, and his church founded Barnstable, Massachusetts. A pastor, Reverend Roger Williams, and his church found Providence, Rhode Island, and the first Baptist church in America. And a John Wheelwright and his church found Exeter, New Hampshire. And a Reverend Thomas Hooker and his church found Hartford, Connecticut. And so let's look at this. This is 50 years before Europe's Age of Enlightenment. You have these pastors that are fleeing. And so Thomas Hooker and his church found Hartford. And when, he get, when they get there, the church members come to him and say, Pastor, can you do a sermon on how we're supposed to set up our government? And so he gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid, Firstly, in the Free Consent of the People. And this is reflected in our Declaration of Independence, government from the consent of the governed. And this is different from Europe because the kings of Europe could care less about your consent. You're not gonna have a king say, can I do this, people? <laughs> they don't care about your consent. And, um, and Reverend Thomas Hooker, the privilege of election belongs to the people. This is reflected in our constitution. We, the people. And uh, Coolidge, Reverend Hooker of Connecticut, as early as 1638, said in a sermon before the general court, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people, right? Everybody's involved. And this doctrine found wide acceptance among the nonconformist clergy who later made up the Congregational Church. His sermon is written down. It becomes the Constitution of Connecticut from 1639 up until 1818. They're using his sermon. And uh, Connecticut's called the Constitution State. Here's a plaque in England. Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. A statue of Thomas Hooker on the Capitol grounds in Hartford, holding a Bible. It says at the base, leading his people through the wilderness, he found that Hartford on this site, he preached the sermon which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created the government. And then another plaque, it says, on this site, uh, Thomas Hooker preached his famous sermon, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. And then representatives of the people adopted as the fundamental orders, their constitution. What do the fundamental orders say? The people conjoin ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Well, who are the people? It's Pastor Thomas Hooker and his church. So again, you have a church group forming itself into a public state, right? Very similar to the Mayflower Compact, a church group forming itself into a civil body politic. Why did they do it? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess. Another plaque, lots of plaques there. Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you grasp the significance of this? Church group, everybody's involved, becomes the colonial government, becomes our U.S. Constitution. Here's another, they have lots of plaques. This one says, Thomas Hooker, leader, preacher, statesman who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. It was such a big deal, they chiseled it in stone so we wouldn't forget it. Why? Because this is different than kings, following mandates. And there's another plaque, it says, uh, Thomas Hooker, a peerless leader in New England thought life in both church and state. And uh, so in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and their churches that created the state. I mean, how could you say pastor, don't talk about politics? when it's his sermon that's their constitution. How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? There were like no non-church members to be lazy and let them take over. 
And uh, the word politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city, like Minneapolis. And politics is simply the business of the city. And all there was in the city of Hartford was the church. And so they had one building called the Meeting House. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible, and that's where they would do their city business. The word synagogue means meeting house. That's where the rabbi would teach the law, and that's where they would do their city business. I mean, why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? And so when the Revolutionary War starts, the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage, and he outlaws meeting houses. Democracy too prevalent in America. We don't want the people meeting and giving their consent. You just follow government mandates. And uh, Coolidge said the principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. They preached equality because they believed in the fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. The King of England did not believe in equality. He believed in divine right of kings, that he was chosen, extra special, right, to be in charge. And Coolidge said, in order that they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action, whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. So that was the 1600s, these Calvinist Puritans coming up with this plan of how we could rule ourselves without a king. But in the 1700s, you had Lutheran pietists, and they said, it's more than a plan. You have to have an experience with Jesus, and when you do, your life will change and you won't do worldly things you used to do, like go to bars and brothels and get involved in government. Wait, what was that last thing? Yeah, government's worldly. If you're really a Christian, you won't be involved. That's the origin of what we've experienced. Oh, I'm a little holier than you are because I'm not involved, right? And um, so the, the Reformation starts. Martin Luther has a revelation that just shall live by faith. And uh, some German princes want to break away from Rome. And so they said, kingdom of mine, mine, I just decided you're all Lutheran. And they're like, okay, we're Lutheran. What do we believe? So for the people in those kingdoms, it's not the same personal experience. And so a revival movement starts called pietism. That says being a Christian is not just doctrine. You have to have this experience with Jesus. And, and uh, <clears throat> so um, these pietists, um, uh, it turns into the German concept of the two kingdoms, kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the church, the two don't touch. There were even German princes that would donate money to the pietists so they would teach their people not to get involved in the prince's business. And uh, four centuries of that allowed Hitler to seize power. And they would put Jews on train cars and they would go past the churches and they're crying out for help. And the church's response was, well, that's the government doing it and we're the church and the government circle and the church, are we, we don't touch each other. And, and so let's just sing praise songs to Jesus louder. Can anybody see there's something wrong with that picture? <laughs> and um, so the Calvinist Puritans were called old lights. And yes, they had a great plan on how we could rule ourselves without a king, but it got so plan focused, it became a little spiritually dry. And uh, then the new lights come along and they say, no, it's more than a plan. You have to have an experience with Jesus. And it's a personal experience, but then it's so personal that it's only personal. And you don't care. And so um, there's actually a, um, uh, a middle of the road, and, and I go through these pietists, and they did bring revival, and they influenced the Wesleys and George Whitfield, and they did preach up and down the colonies, and, and um, but the, um, uh, the, the answer is that you can do both. Um, thank God that it is a personal experience with Jesus, but we want to be involved so that we can preserve a country where our kids can have a chance to have a personal experience with Jesus because they're teaching an agenda in the schools that's not just under, saying you can't talk about God, and you can't talk about Jesus. It's saying that if there is a God, he's so messed up, he's putting men and women's bodies and you have to have operations and lifetimes of drugs to fix it because he's a mess, right? It undermines the whole gospel. And if, you know, if certain behavior is not sin, then arguably there are no sins. And if there's no sins, you don't need a savior. And um, so the most important thing is to bring people to Christ. And the second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. And um, anyway, am I stepping on toes? I apologize. I, um, so I talk about how um, we're, the church is the bride of Christ. And every romance novel, and you know, Hallmark movie, builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. And it's almost like God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment. And some people are gonna choose the all others. 
They're going to want to be liked and friended and followed, and they don't want anybody to cancel them or not invite them to a party. And other people are going to say, I don't care about the all others. All I care about is Jesus. And it's like God is pushing the world. And it's not just us adults. It's going on into the schools. It's going on in the classrooms. It's going everywhere. Everybody's going to be presented with the choice. You know, I was thinking of, why did God make us anyway? And um, in 2003, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. The spot was the size of a grain of sand held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Nothing there. Teeny spot. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that little spot was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. And this is the picture. It's not an artist's rendition. This is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest, fastest, red being the slowest, longest. They saw the red shift, which means you're seeing the slow part of the light because these galaxies are moving away from us. They now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across. And get this, still expanding at the speed of light. God created light. Einstein's theory of relativity is if you could travel the speed of light for you, time would stand still. God created light, he's obviously faster than light, so for God, time stands still. We'll never comprehend that. Um, but there is a verse in the Bible that says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. In other words, we're moving in ultra slow motion compared to God. God exists in the ever-present now. I am that I am. In his presence, you cannot think of the future, you cannot think of the past, and you can't even think, you just experience. I'm in the presence of all power and all beauty and all love all at once, right? And so for God to create our reality, he had to create a little space-time bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to now. <laughs> and um, the, why is that important? Because we get to make our little free will decisions but he can readjust every atom in the universe before time goes to the next frame so that his will is going to take place. It's our little free will, right, inside the context of his sovereign will. So uh, Mordecai goes to Esther and says, there's a mandate to kill the Jews. If you don't do anything, God will raise up somebody else to deliver the Jews. So he gives you a chance to do something. But if you say no, right, God's outside of time. He can say, okay, I'm going to find this other person and I'm going to use that person. He's going to get his will done. The book of Revelation is going to take place exactly the way he said it is, right? But he can get there by using us. And we make our little, sometimes we follow his will, sometimes we're stubborn, and, and then sometimes we repent, right? And um, so the largest star they found is Stevenson 2 18. It's a super gas giant. It's so large, if you were to place Stevenson 2 18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? One star that enormous. And God made it all. And he made you. Why would he make you? What could you offer a being that is that powerful? Nothing, except maybe something. What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So it's almost like in eternity past, in God's infinite wisdom, it, it, he essentially said, been there, done that. I can make everything. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. I mean, think of it. What's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere at the top of the list, it's loving and being loved. And if you're made in his image, could it be that loving and being loved is important to him? He doesn't need your love. He's not incomplete in any way, and your love somehow completes him. He doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. 
And the more you love someone, the more, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. But for love to be love, it must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. If God were to force you to love him in any way, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him, and he would know your response is not a love response. So he wants your love, but he'll never force you, because the moment he forces you, it's no longer love. And, um, you know, he loves everything he created, but could everything he created love him back? Well, everything he made is, follows rules, laws of planetary motion, laws of physics, laws of optics, laws of, you know, thermodynamics, everything's laws. And, and animals follow instinct. I mean, as cute as the puppy are, it's just following its, its instinct. He intentionally created us. He created everything, but he intentionally created one little thing he does not control your will. I mean, he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. So in the context of everything he controls, time, matter, space, energy, he created one little thing. He does not control your will. And um, because it's free will that you, have, you can give love. I looked up the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Never once does it say the angels love God. They worship him, they glorify him, they praise him, they smite his enemies, they deliver his judgments, they deliver messages to, you know, Ezekiel and Daniel and Mary, and, and um, they are heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels. They rejoice when a sinner converts. Uh, but uh, angels cannot forgive. They just obey. <laughs> and um, they're not made in the image of God, and Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They are mighty beings. They are intelligent, beyond comprehension beings. But they were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not very smart and we're not very powerful. <laughs> what can we offer God? Well, the word love is used all throughout the Bible to describe men and women's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Psalms 91 because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Jesus rises from the dead and asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? We are beings created with this unique ability to love God. But for love to be loved, it has to be voluntary. And there's a second thing. He has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you, in all of his universe creating omnipotent power brighter than a trillion trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, is dead. It would be instantaneous and involuntary in the presence of all power, and it would not be voluntary. And God's like, I can do involuntary all eternity long. I'm interested in this voluntary thing. So he has to hide himself. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will's gone. <laughs> In the presence of all power and all beauty and all love, you're, it's an instantaneous response. And the same hiding of himself that allows us an opportunity to have a free will necessitates that we have faith, right? If God showed himself, you wouldn't need any faith anymore because you could see what's going to happen, but you wouldn't have a free will anymore because he shows himself. I was trying to think of a way of explaining it. Imagine a billionaire has a son who goes to college and he flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini. He's got gold rings, fancy clothes, Rolex watch. He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays all that aside, and drives up in an old clunker with holes in his jeans. The uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library. And they eat together in the cafeteria. And they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then one day he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. 
And they're like driving up to this castle mansion. And the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. If Jesus would have come to earth with all of his glory, every political ladder climber would say, I'm your friend, I'm your friend. But instead he was born in a manger. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there was nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. So God creates us with this unique ability to love God, hides himself so that we have the opportunity to love God. But there's a third thing. He's just, and he cannot help it, which means he has to judge every sin. If God does not judge a sin, by default, he would be giving consent to the sin. It's called the rule of tacit admission, and it's in a wedding ceremony where the pastor says, oh, anybody that's against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you are silent, your silence is giving consent to the wedding vows. If there are sins going on and God is silent and not judging the sin, by default, he would be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he's not going to get kicked out of heaven. And he's not going to deny himself. And he is going to judge every sin. So, so he could never be loved back, right? If he creates us as free will beings that can love him, hides himself so that we have opportunity. But if we step out of line, one time he's got to judge us. Because if he doesn't judge our sin, he's giving consent to the sin. And he's denying himself. And he cannot deny himself. So he could never be loved back until he came up with a plan. Actually, he had the plan before he created anything. Actually, actually, it was the plan for which reason he created everything. And the plan was his own son would become a man and take the judgment that we deserve upon himself. It was a hidden plan, plan of redemption. It says if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The Apostle Paul called it the mystery of the gospel. And in this hidden plan, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God, became man. And only as a man could God hang on a cross and die for your sins. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing love, how could it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? So God is just in that he judges every sin, but he's love in that he provided the land to take the judgment. Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah. And Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice and we have the coals for the sacrifice, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. I'm trusting God will have a ram up in the bush, but the others, God will provide himself. Right? And that's what happened. Jesus, the Son of God, became the sacrifice. And you think, okay, there's... Um, one of us, or one of Jesus, and there's billions of us, and we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Um, we all deserve eternal damnation. If God's just, there's only one. How can one balance out with, with billions? Jesus is divine, and he experienced judgment in a dimension we will never comprehend. It says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Jesus experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. You know, you read the book of Revelation. I've read it lots of times, still trying to figure it out. But one thing seems clear. It's, it's God that's pouring out the vials of judgment in the book of Revelation. Lamb breaks the seal, angel throws the censer, angel pours the book. Blows the trumpet. It's like, why is it? Well, that's the final judgment. God's a just God. He has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was this sin way back then and you didn't judge it and you were silent. Were you giving consent to that sin? Is there a part of you that's unjust we don't know about? Uh-uh. It says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. And the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But that's the final judgment. God will not do any more judging for the rest of eternity. 
But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross, experienced it as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. You know, I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who's innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time. It's equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. And he's the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the Lamb of God, like we sang about this morning. He took the judgment that we deserve upon himself. It says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to crush him. And then he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. This way, you and I can approach this universe-creating, omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful, and all-just God without having to worry about being judged. Because all the judgment we deserve went on the Lamb. The Lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. It's His plan. He came up with it before He created the first quark and neutron and electron before he created anything he came up with a plan and the the plan is his way to love you and have you love him back throughout the rest of eternity and him not having to judge you he's a just god he can't, he can't you know mathematical equations you have constants and variables the constant is god is just that'll never change the variable is who takes the judgment you or a substitute <laughs> And Jesus is the substitute. And again, he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. And then he fills you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And then the Holy Spirit does the good works through you to love on a lost and dying world. So instead of you doing the good works, hoping to earn brownie points with God, you're already accepted by God through faith in the blood of the Lamb. And it's the Holy Spirit doing the good works through you clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, rescuing those unjustly sentenced to death, right? They're supposed to be works, but the motivation behind them is different. And there's nothing more exciting than letting the Holy Spirit use you. To let the God of the universe live in you and use you to love on people, right? To reach out and give you a purpose in life. It's His plan. That's why we Sing praise songs to Jesus. We got Jesus written on our forehead. We have his spirit and Holy Spirit in our hearts. Well, I'm going to end with that. Thank you so much. God bless you.